بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome everybody um, to our platform called His Story and here we explore people's lives and their transformation from disbelief into Islam and what journeys they took to arrive at guidance. We live in a world where uh, many people are lost and are trying to find light out of darkness. Yet our Creator, Allah He tells us that the revelation of the Quran is the light. Allah, He says in the Quran, Alif Lam Ra, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka li tukhrija al-nasa min al-dhulumati ila al-nuri bi-idhni rabbihim ila sirat al-aziz al-hamid. Which means that we have sent to you, O Muhammad, this book, a book, in order that you may take the people out of darkness and into the light with their Lord's permission unto the straight path or the path of the Almighty, the praiseworthy. And today, inshallah, we are very happy and excited and blessed to have our brother Dawood, David, uh, with us, who he will share his story of how he came to Islam and many other stories before that, inshallah ta'ala. So without further ado, I would like to greet our brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Good. Thank you for, uh, alhamdulillah, thank you for doing this and, uh, you know, sharing your, your story with us. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, counts it on your scale of good deeds and hopefully somebody will be inspired by this, inshallah. Ameen, ameen. So uh, just to start things off, inshallah, could you tell us um, where you were born and where you were raised? So I was born in uh, Massachusetts, in Malden, Massachusetts, and uh, raised in Lynn, Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, Lynn is a city that's about um, a 20 minute ride from from Boston, north of Boston. Okay. They call it they call it the North Shore. And, uh, you know, the North Shore of Boston is um, you know, Lynn, uh, Revere, uh, Salem, Beverly, uh, these types of areas. There's a lot. There's other cities around, but um, this is the area of the North Shore that I was raised in, which is uh, um, it's uh, yeah, like a I was suburb, like a suburb of, of Boston, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a so it's a city w within itself. You know, oh. um, there's a lot of different cities all around Boston that are. Uh, cities within themselves, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it, it, yeah, technically it is a suburb of Boston, you know, but it's like, it's basically what Newark, New Jersey is to New York. You, I know, see. you, can, see, you can see Boston, like when you're in Lynn, like, and you go to a high point in Lynn, like you can see Boston, it's right there. I've seen a, a, a lot of your, some of your posts about Lynn, you know, and some yeah. of your old friends, they comment also about it uh tell us about lynn like is it is it you know high class or is it what is it? middle class high class it's what um you know it's working class they had a um they, they you know growing up they always had a, a a little limerick they they used to say lynn lynn the city of sin you never went out or you never go out the way you went in you know <laughs> so so lynn is a um doesn't sound too good <laughs> yeah 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 i mean you know for people that grow up there you know you kind of wear that as a badge of honor right but it's not you know um okay. it's it's uh it's one of those things that um you know uh when when you're from there you um you know it you, you grow up in Lynn, lynn is a little rough it's a rough town right rough. yeah it's a rough town and um you know it uh lynn is one of so Lynn is one of the areas that um, uh, Lynn has a drug problem. 
Lynn has a, a, a crime problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, not everything about Lynn is bad. Obviously, every place has good. Every place has bad. But, um, um, you know, Lynn, Lynn has a reputation of being a, a rough area, you know. So, Blue collar mm-hmm. area, rough. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, blue collar. Yeah. Like I said, working class. You know, I grew up in an area of Lynn called the Highlands. And, um, you know, uh, it was a very uh, uh, mixed, you know, you had uh, everybody was there. Right. So everybody you had you had whites, uh, blacks, uh, uh, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, um, you know, um, Cambodians, Laotians, Haitians, like everybody was mixed up in this area, which is actually, a, you know, I appreciate that I grew up this way because, you know, I got to grow up eating like all types of, you know, cuisine from all over the world, just coming home from school and going to my friends' houses, you know, like, mm. you know, today I was eating this, tomorrow I was eating that. It was, it was, a, it was actually a good upbringing and, and being in the city, um, being in the city, you get to experience a lot, uh, outside of, um, so the train, I mean, the train station was within walking distance from me. So, you know, I used to, I used to have to walk along the train tracks. Um, sometimes when, when I was in high school, I used to walk along the train tracks to get home sometimes. and, And that would be, uh, you know, some of my, some of my introduction into the the uh, the the artwork that I would see along the train tracks and the uh, and the different you know the different sites. Sometimes I would just walk the tracks just so I wouldn't get jumped coming from school, you know. Wow, <laughs> that type of thing, you know. So the, being that it was multicultural, did did uh, you know each culture hang out with each other, or was it mixed, or were there were there feuds between? You know all those cultures. No, everybody hung out with everybody. Everybody hung out with everybody. Yeah, there was not. You know, growing up, there was not a big separation between. You know, if you had, uh, you know, Puerto Rican, if you were white and you had Puerto Rican and Dominican neighbors, I mean, you were neighbors, right? Like there yeah. wasn't, there wasn't a big racial divide. Like now, I live in the South, mm-hmm. and typically in the South, you have white neighborhoods and you have black neighborhoods and then you have neighborhoods, uh, you know, South American neighborhoods. Right. And yeah. so you don't see a lot of mixture in the South and you don't see people, you don't see the cultures mixing that much except for at work or at school. Um, but, but, but where I grew up, it was, it was very integrated. People, um, people had babies together, people had families together. There was a lot of, you know, and this was, I mean, you know, and we're talking in the eighties and the nineties, right. There was a lot of um, sort of racial uh, boundaries being crossed, you know, which is which which actually when I moved out of of Lynn Mm -hmm. and I started going to other places in the country and I started to see how amplified the racial situations were outside of where I grew up. It was actually a little bit of a culture shock for me because, um, you know, it was uh, I, I wasn't used to that. You know, I was used to people being growing up, be, there being more of a melting pot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. The South is a bit more, uh, you know, we have segregated neighborhoods. Yeah. It's polarizing here. It's it's a bit polarized still. I mean, even in 2024, there's still a lot of polar polarization and, 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 and not, um, you know, not a, not a big uh, open, um, uh, communication between between different races and and and, and no camaraderie or, or togetherness, you know. Right, right. So you said you were you were like you used to walk ar- along the tracks to avoid getting jumped and things. And that is what is that what first sparked your interest in graffiti? Seeing the trains painted up. I mean, yeah, yeah. I used to. So I used to walk along the train tracks, and I used to see. Um, you know, there were uh, graffiti there were graffiti artists and, and graffiti writers who would have pieces like, um, I don't, you know, um, I could mention dozens of names, but, but that may not mean anything to, uh, to the viewers, but so Go ahead. somebody will watch and they'll recognize the names, you know? Yeah. I mean, there was, yeah, there's, there's a lot of names. I mean, you had writers like, uh, uh, C's and, um, temp hate, um, animate, avoid, 
Sonic. You had all these different um, types of, right, you know, uh, Brett, uh, Dismo, right? You had all these people who they had pieces along along the tracks, the train tracks. And I used to walk the train tracks as a kid and I'd be amazed, you know, because it was like, you know, for a 13, you know, a 12 or a 13 year old kid that would go out on the train tracks just to go out there and like mess around and, and like, you know, throw rocks, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd see like, you'd see these, these beautiful pieces of graffiti on the wall and like, it was as if, you know, superheroes came, awesome. you know, floating down from the sky and just paint. Cause like, you, you didn't know how they got there. You, you had no clue how, how these, you know, how these, these, and, and they were huge, you know, I mean, you, you have these huge murals and you just had no idea how they got there, you know? And so it was very intriguing to a, a young uh, 12, 13 year old kid from Lynn, you know, and that was one of the things, but, um, how I got into graffiti was actually when I was in ninth grade. Um, I was in ninth grade and, and, uh, and so I was already, you know, I already had some um, exposure to graffiti like before ninth grade, but uh, you know, I, I didn't know much about like graffiti as a culture, right? Because graffiti has a culture and uh, previous to that, it was just, I was just seeing it in the neighborhood. You walk around the neighborhood and you see, you know, you see tags. I remember this one specific time I was in either fifth or sixth grade and somebody had did a piece on the side of the school that I went to. I went to a school called Hood School and somebody, yeah, Hood School. Yep. Um, and it was, um, so, so there was, there was somebody did a piece on the side of the, um, on the side of the, the actual school. And they called all of the students out to try to find out who did it, right? Like to see if maybe any one, of, any one of the kids knew who actually did it. Maybe one of their bigger brothers did it, or maybe one of the school children did it. And they pulled everybody out and they showed it to us. And I had no idea, obviously I, I had no idea how it happened, but you know, I looked at it and and I was just I was mesmerized and I and I feel like that was the moment that I caught the graffiti bug, you know, because I always I always um, I you always you had art like did you know you had it in you at that moment or yeah so you know I grew up in a, as an only child right so my 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 parents they always sat me down with a notebook and a pen uh, or some crayons or some markers. Or, or pencils, like they always encouraged me to draw when I was little because I, um, I don't know, I guess they just saw I had an inclination for it, you know? So I, I always drew as a young, as a young kid. I mean, when my parents would be, uh, we would be, would be over family's house and this and that, and they, they, they just set me up. They, they, they knew all they had to do to keep me busy was to set me up with a, 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 a notepad and a marker and I'd be busy for the next three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw that that mural on the side of the school and that that's what did it right yeah so i remember seeing it and i just remember standing there like this you know just looking at it and i and, and i always like i was saying i always feel like i got i got bit by the graffiti bug at that moment you know that's when i got infected by the graffiti disease and so anyone who anyone who writes graffiti will tell you it, it, it is a bit like an addiction because here i am now 48 years old, right? Third, uh, four years later, you know, and I'm still involved in it. And I still, you know, I mean, obviously I've gotten better and I've turned it into an art and I've, I've turned it into a business yeah. and, and, you know, and I've taken it to, to, to new heights, right? I'm not just scribbling on, on school buildings anymore. Right. But, um, you know, that was the, I, I think that was the initial thing that sparked me and, you know, uh, 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 kind of set it off at that moment, you know, but then I started to meet people along the way. And I was saying that in ninth grade, I met, uh, uh, you know, a lifelong friend and partner of mine. His name was, um, what he wrote was Dismo. Mm -hmm. And we met, we met, and when we met, we, that's when we really, you know, we started to really bounce ideas off of each other. And, and like, you know how it is when you have somebody to collaborate with, right? It's like it's it's an encouragement. So that that was something that um, that was something that was really 
uh, I guess, influential in my in my in my in my development and progression as a, as an artist and as a you know as just somebody who was into graffiti. But you know, I think if looking back, everybody everybody had a tag name, right? Everybody like I don't know where did you grow up? I grew up in Dallas. In Dallas, so like yeah. in Dallas, I'm sure they had a graffiti scene. For sure, yeah. Right, and you, and how old are you? Me, I'm I'm in my. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell. It. I have some young students, and they don't know how old I am. But now they're gonna see this. So I'm I'm forty. Wash out, wash out. Wash out. I just put you on blast, brother. Yeah, it's okay. I'm I just put you on blast. You, you started stuttering too. I said, uh oh, I hit a nerve. <laughs> wash out, wash out. It's okay. I'm forty three. Yeah. Forty three. Okay. Yeah. So, so probably when you were coming up, there was a we there was, we yeah there was a we had in Garland, Texas, um, in a train station over there, you know, and um, I wasn't I, I, I'm not an artist by any means, so every time I tried to do graffiti, it's <laughs> you know, amazing the letters really and the letters with the arrows, and the, I, I could never figure it out. Uh, I got good at just writing my name, Elir, you know, uh, right. but I couldn't do anything else, you know, but we did have that. We had, uh, you know, we had a, it wasn't big like it was in the East Coast, but it was uh, down here. Uh, what I want you, if you can, you know, is, so you, you met, it was his name Dismo, you said? Dismo, yeah. Yeah. Can you take us through like a day's life in a graffiti artist like when do you do the art do you was it legal was it illegal do you wait till night do you are you talking about now or then 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 okay in your, so when in, you your, were... in your official graffiti days like back then yeah 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 i mean okay now well i i will add that now before i get into what it was like then i probably paint more graffiti now than i paint than i painted back then but now i have a um I have a uh, a method, and um, and 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 one of my methods that I use is because uh, obviously I'm 48 years old, so the idea of going around and tagging illegally people's property is is you know it's kind of silly at 48 years old, right? But you know what I do is I um you know I approach business owners yeah. who have you know maybe they have a graffiti problem on the side of their so you know people will come and they'll do ugly graffiti. On the side of their building so i'll come and and usually i approach them and say you know number one i try to get a job out of it because i'm a, at the end of the day i'm an artist and i get paid to do art so um you know i'll i'll try to get paid and if they don't want to if they don't want to um <clears throat> if they don't want to pay me then that's cool i say okay well then just give me your wall and then just let i have free creative control to do what i want to do and then when i have time you know, and usually, and so anyone who's an artist will tell you, art is like being an artist and and being being an artist is like, it's like, you know, you get um, that expression you need to express. So whether they're paying me to paint or not paying me to paint, I'm still gonna paint. So, um, you know, it's better to have a place that somebody can appreciate it than for me to be 48 years old and creeping around trying to do illegal graffiti on people's stuff. So I, you know, I usually will get get permission now to uh, to do that type of thing, you know. Uh, but there's also areas where, you know, they call them like free expression malls. And, you know, we have we we you have other graffiti writers who have, you know, their their spots where they, you know, so we invite each other, like somebody will have a wall over here. I'll have a wall over here. I'll invite them over here to paint and we'll collaborate and do something. They'll invite me over there to paint with them and we'll do something on their wall. So, you know, people, people kind of curate, um, you know, and now it's actually such a thing where like, I, I, um, you know, I just came back from Miami. There was this thing called Art Basel. And so people will curate, hundreds if not thousands of walls it's so like there's so much art going on in Miami wow. in this particular time that people curate these walls and, and and artists fly in from all over the world and 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 just do hundreds and hundreds of murals I, I painted 
I don't know, four or five of them myself while I was there wow. in Miami. So it's kind of like the graffiti Olympics. <laughs> you know, were, were there, you know, back in the day, graffiti Olympics, that's funny. But back it's in funny. the day, when, when, like you would see, you know, the, uh, somebody's name up on the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were there like uh, graffiti battles? Like, do you scratch out his name, put yours? Uh, yeah, yeah. We used to common or yeah, we used to battle each other, you know. Because all right, so just to be clear, we were kids, right? right? And not only were we kids, we were city kids, and we were kids who, you know, uh, you know, and we were egotistical, and we grew up in that hip hop era, you know, and. Just like there was battles in hip hop, there was battles among, we used to battle each other. We used to go, uh, on, we used to call them line wars. And so like, you know, I would, wherever I would see your name. So if me and you had a line, if me and you had beef, anytime I saw your name, I would cross it out. And anytime you saw my name, you know, it's sort of like people, a lot of times people don't understand the difference between uh, gang graffiti and, and, and graffiti writing, right? Like what we call, we don't call it, we don't, we call it writing, right? Yeah. We call, we refer to ourselves graffiti writers. We, we refer to ourselves as writers. It's not necessarily a gang. It has nothing to do with like Bloods and Crips type gang. It's really to elevate the art, but you also have to understand that graffiti writers in general are, you know, egotistical, self-centered, right? Uh, uh, street kids, you know, oftentimes involved in other crimes, right? Which, you know, alhamdulillah, I got away from all of that throughout the years. And, you know, particularly, I mean, I took, I became Muslim in, in, when I was 25 years old. And, uh, you know, but previous to being Muslim, I was a different person. So now that I'm, uh, now that I'm, you know, uh, uh, now that I'm Muslim, I had to find a way. How do I, um, you know, how do I integrate my, my Islam with my 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 still my my desire to be able to paint and be artistic and be creative, right? right. How do I do this without you know uh, 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 without there being a conflict conflict of interest, right? Without there being without being somebody who goes out and destroys people's property, right? Because right. this is obviously not a good look for a you know forty eight year old Muslim dad, right? <laughs> look. But you know, alhamdulillah, I figured it out, and that's that's been one of the things that I did. But back in the day, um, you know, back in the day, uh, yeah, we used to we used to cross each other out. We used to beef with each other. I mean, sometimes it would end up in you know in fights. Like we would fight over it, you know, because oh, yeah, like the violence sometimes. Huh? Yeah, we would fight over, and it sounds childish, and 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 you know, it sounds childish and like kind of like you know ninth grade. But that's because it is. You know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna sit here as a I'm not going to sit here as a grown man and, and and defend like graffiti beef. It's silly, right? But um, you know, that's just what we were involved in. So like when you're out there and you're putting all that effort and work and somebody just comes and crosses it out, you get mad. You know, you you want to throw hands with that guy. So, you know, we used to, yeah, we used to do that kind of thing. We you know, I mean it's silly, but it's just like if somebody, you know, it's like if like imagine if you had um, you know, uh worked on a um if you were a uh, carpenter and you had worked on a beautiful um, piece of carpentry or something, and then someone just came and punched a hole through it, you know, sure. you, you that would upset you, you know, but that's the, that's the name of the game though. That's kind of how it is. So, which is ironic because also the person's property, <laughs> you know, you're yeah. spraying on somebody's property. He's also getting upset that somebody, you know, <laughs> right. Right. And that's one of the things that I ask myself today when, when, I always decide if I'm going to do uh, if I'm if I'm going to paint something on somebody's property. Number one, I I always try to get permission. Uh, but I, number two, I always ask myself: Is this something that somebody would be upset about? Mm. You know? Yeah. Is this something that somebody be would have? Is somebody going to wake up tomorrow and look at this and go, "Oh man." Now I gotta paint this. Oh, you know, is it gonna bother somebody? Is it gonna take somebody's rights away from them? If if so, I'm 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 not gonna do it. Mashallah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. That's how Islam has transformed us, man. Yeah. Now speaking of that, you mentioned you were 25 when I when I took shahada. Yeah. 
Yes, 25 years old. 25. Can you tell us about that? Like, what led to that? What led to me becoming Muslim? Yeah. That's a long story, brother. Are you? I'm here, here, brother. That's you here for it? Are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm all ears, brother. You know. That's a long story. Okay. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah. Um, well, bye. <laughs> there was a, um, so, you know, there's a lot of kind of um, elements that led me to, to becoming Muslim, you know, and I could kind of start at the beginning, but um, I'll, I'll lead to, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go straight to the day that I took Shahada because there was, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a period that, and I'll just say briefly, there was a period that um, I was learning about Islam out of curiosity because, so I have a, I have a friend, well, I have a, you know, we used to call each other cousins. You know how when you grow up with somebody, yeah. you say, that's my cousin, right? That's yeah. yeah, my cousin, you know, and, and, you know, we would meet the girls and we would say, that's my cousin, you know, but that, um, anyway, he ended up, he ended up taking Shahada. His story is, is that he got stabbed 28 times. They stabbed him all through his body and legs 28 times. And then there was some uh, Muslims who they, um, it was some Muslims who, uh, when they found out that he got stabbed, because he, you know, this was, so he lived in um, in an area of, of Boston called Mission Hill. Hmm. And so he had, they had found out that he got stabbed and um, the Muslims came to visit him and they gave him Shahada that day. And so, um, so he wasn't a Muslim before he, he wasn't, got he wasn't previously a Muslim. No, oh, he wasn't. Pre he wasn't previously his uh, brother. His name is Abdurrahman. And so he wasn't previously Muslim. And um, he, he ended up taking Shahada that day while he was basically on his deathbed. Like we did. We thought he was. We didn't think he was going to make it. He got stabbed 28 times. And so, you know, alhamdulillah, he, you know, he. He, he was able, he had enough strength to actually crawl up on somebody's um, uh, 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 porch and then ring the bell. And, you know, alhamdulillah, they were home and they came out and they just saw him, you know, bloody and a mess laying on the on, on their porch. And they called the, the ambulance and, the, you know, so the ambulance came and they, they revived him. But he took Shahada. I don't know if it was, no, it couldn't have been that day, but, you know, a few days later when he was in the hospital, he took Shahada because the Muslims came and visited him and they told him like, you know, uh, yeah. really you should become Muslim now. And so he became Muslim at that point and um, he didn't really change his life. You know, he was, you know, we were all kind of involved in sort of like street activity and, you know, never any, Never any like real big crimes, you know, just kind of dumb stuff, you know. Yeah. I'm not gonna go into detail about all the crimes and the dumb things that we're involved in. We're we're involved in some pretty stupid activities, but you know, he ended up going to jail a couple of months later on a um on an armed robbery. Mm. Uh, well, actually it was a house invasion. So he he did um he pled out. He did two years on the house invasion. And then he uh, while he was in prison, he started to practice Islam because now he was a Muslim. Right. He 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 took Shahada, but like it didn't really change him. You know, he didn't he didn't get around Muslims after that. He just kind of went back to his life. He got arrested. Then he did. Then he did time. And then when he then when he went in prison and, you know, and anybody knows when you go in prison, um, you know, you need backup. Right. So here he was, he went in prison, you know, I guess he decided, okay, it's, maybe it's time to get my life together, right? He started practicing Islam in prison and then he, um, you know, he came out as a practicing Muslim, you know, yeah. beard grown out, reciting Quran. Inshallah. He didn't have anywhere to stay. He came to stay with me, uh -huh. you know, and, um, you know, I remember he used to get up in the, in the morning and he would call the Adhan in the house. And I, and I wasn't Muslim at the time. And he would call the Adhan in the house and he would pray Fajr. And, um, you know, and I would get annoyed, you know, I'd be throwing stuff at him because, you know, but like, uh, you know, he used to take me to the masjid with him. 
He would throw stuff at him. So <laughs> yeah, because he was like, you know, early in the morning, Fajr time. You yeah, yeah, it's you five in the morning, and he's like, Allah, you know, and I'm just throwing stuff at him, like go go to sleep, you know, because I don't know what he's doing. Like he's just yeah. in my mind, he's just <laughs> right, like yeah, yeah. what he's doing. He's just, you know, I know he's Muslim, but uh, you know, I don't know what that means. And so um, he started taking me to the masjid with him, and at the time, I had a I was doing tattoos, actually. That was my occupation. So I was, uh, and tattoos actually were illegal in the state of Massachusetts. So I was doing like underground. Oh, wow. They were. They were illegal. SubhanAllah. I had, a, I had a whole tattoo studio set up in my house. Mm. And I was doing it like illegally, but, you know, still professionally. I had learned how to actually, you know, do everything san sanitary and, um, you know, I went to a guy who um, he, uh, he 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 you know he mentored me on tattoos, and so at the time I was doing tattoos, and that was my that was my that was my occupation, that was my livelihood, and um, you know, uh, and it was kind of a it was kind of a uh, a natural progression from doing graffiti to tattoos, you know, because yeah. actually you can actually see like I have a graffiti style tattoo well, right there yeah. on my arm mm -hmm. from those days, right? That I never, you know, so I, that was, I, I was really popular because I was the only one that was doing graffiti style tattoos in the early nineties, right? Nobody was doing that. None of the other tattoo artists had came from that graffiti style background that I, that I had. So, you know, I was in high demand and I was, I was making a lot of money and it was at that time, you know, I wasn't really looking for Islam. I wasn't looking for enlightenment. You know, I, I wasn't looking for um, a pathway to God or to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I wasn't looking for anything like that. I thought everything was going good in, in my life, you know. But um, um, what happened was he started to take me to the um, to the masjid. There was a masjid in uh in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, he started taking me there, and um, I became really interested in, in in knowing about. Like, I became really curious about Islam, not from a oh I want to become religious standpoint. I became really interested in Islam from a just from a curi curious standpoint, and like I considered myself like a student of. Um, you know, of the world, a student of the of the planet. You know, I just wanted to know what was going on on the earth. And I realized when I started to get around Muslims, I realized that I didn't um, know much about Islam. Yeah. And, and and I also realized that a, a third of the planet believed this way. And so I, I just sort of, you know, I, I entered into a really sort of like active curiosity about Islam um, just to lift ignorance of, off myself, if not for nothing else, not to actually get closer to Allah or anything like that. But I remember the first time it I heard, wasn't, it wasn't spiritually like it wasn't spiritual. It was more of a just a knowledge based thing. Knowledge based. I didn't. Yeah, it wasn't spiritual because I, I, I wasn't looking for that at the time. As a matter of fact, my opinion, my opinion was that um, religions were man made. Mm -hmm. Right. That was my opinion at the time, because I grew up Christian and, um, you know, this was just my opinion that all religions were came from man and they were they were, they were all man made to control people, you know, on right. some government conspiracy theory stuff. You know, like that was really like my opinion of all religions. And of course, that changed mm -hmm. when I learned about Islam. Mm -hmm. But um, I remember the first time I heard the event. I was at the I was at this masjid in in in, um, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you know Cambridge is where Harvard is where Harvard is, and so uh, the brother called the event, and um, something happened in my heart wow. <laughs> that had never happened before. Like my heart just, I heard that event, and my heart just, like I, the only way I can explain it was that like, just. It just it, it it just became overwhelmed with with all this all this emotion, you know, when I heard the Adhan. and I completely was not expecting it because again, I didn't go there looking for spirituality or or an answer. But I heard the Adhan 
and my heart became overwhelmed with emotion the first time I heard it. And so when that happened to me, I started to think, um, okay, well, maybe maybe there is something here that I need, you know, because you have those um, you have those experiences and, and, and you know, um, uh, sort of, um, you know, Allah says in the Quran that, you know, I'm, I'm going to I'll say the English. He says that uh, verily in the creation are signs for those who reflect. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I feel like that was one of the signs that that, you know, when I heard the event and the way that it made me made me feel at that time, it, it just it, it made me open my eyes and mm -hmm. start to pay attention from from not with my brain, but with my heart. Mm. And so um, um, uh, I went about four months, every single Juma, I became, I, I went to Juma for four months and I didn't miss a Juma because again, I was doing tattoos and I, I, so I set my own schedule, right? I was my own boss. Nobody told me I couldn't be there. I wanted to be there every Friday. And um, it wasn't so much the Juma that um, I was attracted to. It was the it was the the brotherhood after Juma, uh. right? So because oh, and by the way, this is for some of the imams who may be listening. The imam used to speak for forty five minutes in Arabic, and then he would speak for five minutes in English, and then by the time it would get to the English, I would be asleep. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little side note for some of the imams who might be listening. Don't do that. Point try, to, yeah. try to if you're gonna speak Arabic, at least you know maybe Arabic English, Arabic English. You know, keep right. keep maybe because there's a lot of people out there who don't speak Arabic and who you know they need to be engaged as well. You know, so right. anyway, I would I would fall asleep. But even though I would go there and fall asleep, and I would miss the English part, and and I didn't I didn't catch any benefit from the chutbah at all. Um, I would still go every single week because I wanted to, after Juma, I wanted to, you know, hang out with the brothers. And I wasn't even Muslim yet. I just wanted to be there in the, in the midst of the brothers because I noticed, uh, I noticed a type of, um, you know, camaraderie and, you know, respect for, respect for knowledge. And um, it was something that I didn't have in my, you know, in my, my, my group of, of, of friends, you know, there wasn't a, um, you know, I mean, we had camaraderie with each other, but, but, but the, the lifestyle we were living, you know, there was drugs, there was alcohol, there was uh, just a lot of uh, commotion, you know, in my life at that time. And I, and I needed something that I was attracted to that calmness that, that, that the Islamic uh, environment provided, you know? And so, um, uh, yeah, that was um, I. Um, that was my initial. That was my initial um, kind of introduction and attraction to Islam. You know, that adhan, huh? That adhan opened you up. The adhan, yeah, Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Yeah. The nice adhan, not not like the brother who in your house. <laughs> How was his adhan? <laughs> no, his adhan was. Uh, you know, yeah, it's funny because when he would call the Adan, it didn't have the same effect. Yeah. But I think, I think, um, I think it was maybe it was the the environment. Yeah, all with, of it mixed in, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, the environment mixed in with the, um, you know, plus I was at Allah's house, right? Yeah. And um, when you're laying in your bed trying to sleep, you know, and this is another point, you know, sometimes you know when you deliver the the. The information. I remember there was this brother named Abdul Malik. You know, he used to always tell me, uh, "Yeah, Dawood, you need to be gentle with the people." That's what he used to say. Like when I was a new Muslim, and I and you know, you know, when you're a new Muslim and you're so energetic and you want to share Islam with the world, yeah. he used to tell me, "Dawood, you got to be gentle with the people. You mm -hmm. know, you you can't be too rough." And and uh, and he gave the example of um, he said, "What's your favorite food?" And I said, um, I said, oh no, man, I like uh, I like pasta and meatballs and salad. You know, he said, imagine if somebody get, gave you pasta and meatballs and salad, and put it on a trash can. He said, would you would you want to eat it? I said, no, of course not. 
He said, well, if you take that same meal and put it on a nice, clean plate, he said, anyone would want to eat that. I said, <laughs> I said okay. That's a nice, nice All one. Right. Mean of the point, matter. It's like the... Point yeah. taken. No. Nah. Point That's taken. Not, That's beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, so that began your interest. And then... Uh, when was your Shahada day? Like, when was it? Like, tell us about that day. Like, what happened? Why did you choose? So the day that I took Shahada uh, was not a day that I was expecting to take Shahada. I didn't wake up that day and say, and say okay, I'm going to be Muslim today. Mm -hmm. um, I already had went through that four months of time, you know, de uh, developing a profound respect for Islam. But I didn't necessarily think that I was going to become Muslim because I still had it in my mind that, you know, I can take parts of it that I like and I have the parts of it that I don't like, you know, I can learn the information and I can, things that I like, I can incorporate into my life, but I don't have to pray and fast, you know, that's for Muslims. I'm not a Muslim, you know? So those are the things that I was thinking in my mind. And so I met a brother and um, we called him, uh, we called him, his name was Tofiq. And so uh, I was outside of the masjid after Juma one day and he approached me and he's, he, and he's a brother from Algeria. And he yeah. said, he was like, Salam Alaikum brother. He said, he said, uh, he said, um, he said, how you doing? And we started talking and he, he asked me, he said, how, so how long you been Muslim? And I told him, oh, I'm not Muslim. And he goes, um, he said, well, why not? And so I said, uh, I said, well, you know, I said, um, you know, I said, I, I respect Islam and, you know, I like Islam. And I said, if I if I were to probably if I were to become religious, you know, I probably would become a Muslim. I said, but, um, you know, I do this. I do this. I you know I started lift, listing off some of the things that I did, some of my sins that were against Islam. You know, I mm -hmm. said, I did this, this, this. I said, you know. I said, you know, I, I got to get myself together and then maybe I'll become Muslim. Mm. And so he looked at me and he said, no, no, no. He goes, brother, you're doing it wrong. He said, um, he said, you think Muslims are perfect? He said, we all sin. He said, but he said, but you have to remember, he said, he said, um, how do you think that you'll ever get dry if you never come out of the water? SubhanAllah. That's what he said to me. And the way he said it, it, it was another. It was it was another one of those signposts. It was it was another like highway sign for me. You know, you know, you're on the right way. You're on the right path. I said, oh man. I said, wow, that's like you know, you know when somebody speaks the truth, yeah, and you know it's the truth. I said, man, he's right. So I can't argue with that at all. And so anyway, he um, he said to me, um, he said to me, um, uh, what, so what are you doing right now? And I told him nothing, you know. I said, well, I was just hanging out with the brother, Abdurrahman. We were, you know, we just came for Juma, and we were going to go do something else afterwards, just, just nothing really. And so he said, hold on a second. So he jumped on the phone with a brother named Ahmed. And um, Ahmed was another brother from Algeria. And so Ahmed was the more uh, learned one, you know, the more studious one amongst them. Ahmed was a, um, you know, he was a very studious brother. And he, his, and his, um, you know, he always, Ahmed thinks his English is not good, but Ahmed's English came across, came across, you know how a lot of times yeah. Arabic, Arab, Arab speaking brothers, oh, they don't, um, they don't think their English is good, yeah. but, when he spoke English to me, his English came across pure and clear because I had been listening to khutbahs. I had been listening to all types of information about Islam. The way that this brother delivered Islam to me, because we went to his house, you know, um, we went to this brother Ahmed's house, you know, Tofiq took me to Ahmed's house and we went there. And um, the way he delivered Islam to me, it was as if all these bits and pieces of puzzle pieces that I have been collecting for the last four months, he put them all together and placed them together and I saw the picture. Uh, and the only thing he did, I'll tell you what he did. He 
he explained to me the six articles of faith hmm. and the five pillars of Islam in a very detailed way. He and he went he went through them like you know first he talked he talked about Allah, he talked about the books, the messengers, you know Yom Qiyama, right, the Qadr, uh, you know. Angels. All, the angels, right? Yeah. So he and, and and he talked about, you know, Muslims believe this, Muslims believe this, Muslims believe this, Muslim and Muslims believe that. He said, um, and then he then he talked about the five pillars of Islam, and what and what it what it's required for a Muslim to do. And then he stopped and he said, and um, he stopped and he said to me, if um, if there's anything about what I said that you don't believe in. And that you don't accept fully with your full heart, he said. Then I, I advise you to go and you know and to ask questions and to and to investigate. He said, but if you fully accept what I just told you in totality with your full heart, he said. Then then I then I I fully advise you to accept shahada right now, to accept Islam right now, oh, wow. you know, and, and to not delay. This and was so at his house. That was at his house. That was at his house. And so, subhanAllah, man, at that moment, I had this, I had something happen to me. I had like a, a mountain on my back, right? A mountain on my back. It was, it, it felt like not pr not pressure to accept the slam, but it was felt, it just felt like you, like I had to do, I had to make a very serious decision at that moment. And I'm gonna tell you, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. You know, I, I um, um. There, so when I was when I was 15 years old, or 16 years old, I um, I um, I was in church. And so, you know, confirmation when you're in when you're in. Con I I don't know what your background is if you had a Christian background at all, but um, they have this thing they call it confirmation. And and it's kind of like taking shahada for a, for a Christian. But is it, they, is it, it's like Catholic or uh, I was so no. I mean I I'm, I don't know if Catholics do it, but I was at a um, I was at a, uh, a Methodist church. Okay, they call, they call them a Methodist. They're like sort of like I don't I don't want to say the wrong thing, but they, it was a Methodist church. I didn't know yeah, much Methodist, yeah. But this they had a called confirmation. Confirmation, and what this confirmation is. Is they when you reach a when you reach puberty as a Christian child, they want you to go and stand in front of the congregation and you say, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I bear witness that Jesus is my. Uh, I don't want to say it, but you know, know. Uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying so they'll say, you know, so you go in in front of the people and you testify in your Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. So, and at that point. <clears throat> At that point, um, I was supposed to. Uh, so all the all the other um, all the other all the other teenagers, 15, 16 years old, that age, they were all, the, you know, all of us were in a row, and they were going from person to person to person, and each one of them were saying it. And when they came to me, they said, um, you know, I was expected to say that, and I and and they they said, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I said, um, I said, no, nah, I'm good. Wow. In front of the whole congregation. I said, no, I'm good. And so and I don't know what it was that made me say that, but I just didn't feel it in my heart. Yeah. And I, you know, and I didn't feel, you know, in, in my in the way that my parents raised me, that they always raised me like, hey, if you don't, you know, if you don't feel it in your heart, you don't then don't do it. You know, yeah. speak the truth. You know, that this is the way they raised me. So I, you know, and I, and I thought maybe I would get in trouble. I was young, but I mean, also, I was a little bit rebellious at that age, too. And so I just decided I was just going to look, I don't feel like doing it. I'm not going to do it. So <clears throat> after, you know, they just skipped over me. They went to the next person. Right. <laughs> so afterwards, there was there's a story. There's a reason why I'm telling you all this. Right. And so um, there was a, 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 a there was a youth pastor named Bruce and Bruce came to me. I wonder it would be funny if Bruce is still alive and if he, he actually saw this. Right. But Bruce came to me. And he said, um, he said, look, I understand why you did what you did, you know, or at first he asked me why I didn't, you know, why I didn't say, you know, Jesus Christ is your Lord and say, why didn't I say it? And so I, I said, well, I just didn't feel it in my heart. 
Mm. You know? And so he said to me, and I'll never forget these words, you know, you, you know how you have those moments in your life that you'll never forget? Yeah. I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, he said to me, um, he said to me, that's okay. He said, because one day God is going to come to you and he's going to show you his way. So and when he shows you his way, he said, don't reject it. And I said, well, how am I going to know? He said, you're going to feel it in your heart. Wow. And so I was like, okay, fair enough, you know? And I went about I went about the rest of my day and I never thought about religion for another 10 years until that day that I was sitting there with Ahmed. And, 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 and my heart was so full with just bursting with, you know, this is the truth. Like I, you know, and, and, and when he said to me, when Ahmed said to me, you know, I, I fully, you know, if you if you believe in everything that I've said to you today, then I advise you to, you know, if you don't believe it, then don't take Shahada. But if you do believe it, then I advise you to take Shahada right now. And so he kind of like wasn't trying to pressure me, mm -hmm. but I was like, no, 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 I'm ready. I said, I need to take Shahada right now. Lord. And so, you know, Shadun la ilaha illallah, Shadun the Muhammad Rasulullah. I said, they, he said, repeat after me. And then I repeated after him. And that's when, the, and that was the day I became Muslim. And how did you feel right after that? Subhanallah, I had a weight on my back as far as like as as like a mountain. And when I took Shahada, I felt light as a bird. Allah Akbar. Subhanallah. Man. I felt light as a bird, Akhi. It was like nothing else, you know. And uh, you know, and to this day, like it, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Like I wish I could get that feeling back, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Subhanallah, sweet, sweet feeling, man. Subhanallah. Yeah, the sweetness of you, man. I, I really like. Alhamdulillah, you know. Alhamdulillah, I, I thank Allah. You know, all these years later, that was in, that was two thousand and one, so that was twenty three years ago. I took Shahada. You know. You know what month was it? I'm just curious. Was it prior to September eleventh or after? It was prior to September eleventh. Yeah. So as a just curious, like as a new Muslim, you know, prior to September eleventh, then. I'm sure months after that, September 11th happened. Mm -hmm. What was your outtake on that? Um, you know, my first, uh, uh, you know, SubhanAllah, do you want to know about what it was like the day of September 11th or did what it was feel, like? Did you feel following after, after, like weeks you after? Feel pressure, pressure from society, from people, because I know things got rough for Muslims, you know. You know, honestly, I didn't feel pressure because. Um, I did notice that there were a lot of um, a lot of the uh, immigrant Muslims. Yeah, they were um, they they were they were you know I could I could see that they were under pressure. But as an American Muslim, you know I think I I think as we have a little bit of arrogance and you yeah. know braggadocio, yeah. we're like man, come on man, you ain't gonna say nothing about right. you know right. <laughs> I ain't no terrorist. What are you crazy? I'll smack you. You know <laughs> like you know that, so we're a little bit like. You know, because I remember I used to walk inside the um, I used to walk inside the, uh, 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 you know, like the corner stores. Right. And, you know, there'd yeah. be the brother that's working behind the, the store. And, you know, prior to September 11th, I'd walk in. Salam alaikum. And he's like, wa alaikum salam. And then like after September 11th, I walk in. Salam alaikum. And he's like, you know what I mean? <laughs> So it was a difference, yeah. and I and I yeah. pulled the brother aside. I said, "No, I can't listen. Don't do, don't do that, man. Don't feel shy because Islam is not about this terrorism." Because I remember the day of September 11th, I called up Ahmed because you know Ahmed was like my sheikh. You know what I mean? I called him up and I said, "Yeah, Ahmed." I said, "What's going on with all this stuff, man? They're saying Muslims are terrorists and this and that." He said, "No, no, 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 no." He goes. He said, he said, Islam, he said, even if it was Muslims who did that, he said they were misguided Muslims. He said, and Islam does not allow uh, 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 um, the, the killing of innocent people. He said there were there were, uh, you know, thousands of innocent people in those buildings. And he said Islam would never allow that. And he set me straight from day one. Right. So I didn't have any um, ambiguity or, or, you know, confusion about what was the right thing to think at that time. Right. You know? So, you know, but but I think a lot of the immigrant Muslims, they just if you know, if they don't if they didn't if they didn't know much about their deen. Yeah. You they know, were scared. They were scared, a lot of them. They were scared they, because they didn't know how to respond. Like us that were born and raised here, you know, we handle the situation, I think, uh more bravely, you know. 
uh, because right. you know, they, you know, they they could threaten the immigrants to send them back, or you know, they're more vulnerable. But we weren't more vulnerable. And yeah. I lived in Boston, and that's and and listen, right after September 11th, people were disappearing off the streets. Muslims, yeah. Oh. Yeah, they were they were disappearing off the streets. People, there was there were sisters, Moroccan sisters, coming oh. to the masjid. Like you know, I haven't seen my husband in two weeks, and oh. you know, and they, yeah, they were getting. I remember even even um, two times I, I got accosted by the uh, homeland security police two yeah. times, two separate occasions. You know, they were um, you know because they were just on edge. Yeah, they were and on edge, and they, it was their orders to do it. I remember I was driving. On I-45, I-45 is a highway here in Texas that connects Dallas and Houston. And I was with my uh, wife and her uh, her little brother at the time. I mean, he was a teenager at the time. He was a non-Muslim, so he got to experience this. We got pulled over right after September 11th, and you know, he made us sit down on the side. You know, he was very he was pretty disrespectful. He opened uh, our trunk, and I remember he was saying, uh, do you guys have any, if you remember, anthrax? He said, you remember the anthrax deal? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You have anthrax in the no, car. You're not, you're I not talking know about what anthrax the, was at the time. I was like, anthrax? You're not talking about the rock and roll band, anthrax. No, no, not. <laughs> <laughs> no, the anthrax, like, they, they, there was some, see, all of this, man, Allah knows who did it, how it was planned, but. They would mail like in a mail like white powder, which was like some kind of anthrax. No, I know. I was just joking. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was playing. Look at the brother Bilal. He's, he's come on, bro. Really? <laughs> but yeah, anthrax. I know what you're talking about too. But uh, now he pulled us over, and I remember I had at that time uh, cassettes of uh, Abdul Basit. Wait, you can see you could see comments. Yeah, I don't see any comments. See the comments? No, I, I can't you see them. You should be the... able to see them. Check your upper right corner. It should say comments. Nah, I don't see anything. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of comments. Let me just go through before we continue. There's some people who gave you salams. Malik, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Bilal, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Salam wa rahmatullah. Fahmi, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Omar Mitchell, Abdul Karim, barakallahu fikum. Abu Jamaila. My old friend Dawood, really good brother. And Mr. Abdul Karim Pavlicek. Salams from Ojala, Mr. Oh, Science Science. Ohala. Ohala. Oh, sorry, the J. Yeah, Spanish. Yeah, word. it's the silent J. The brothers oh, from what? Chicago. Was that his uh, was that his tag name? Also? Huh? Was that his tag name? Ohala? Yeah. No, no, no. Ohala is the um it's a it's a dawa effort. Dawa effort. Oh. effort. Effort from uh, from Chicago from uh, from Chicago. Oh, okay, mashallah. mashallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, Abdul Kareem. Is uh, uh, you don't know Abdul Kareem? Yeah, I know Abdul Kareem from uh, uh, Facebook and yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, his efforts in Dawah. I see his posts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Ohala is the um, is their um, their organization. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Is that is that Spanish? That must be Spanish, huh? It is. It means inshallah in Spanish. Oh, like God willing, huh? inshallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Inshallah. Yeah. So Abu Abu Layla also the rock and roll band Anthrax. He he <laughs> he's laughing about that. Salam. <laughs> Salam. Yeah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> yeah. So where were we? Oh yeah, they pulled me over, and anyway, yeah. they found the uh, uh, these Quran tapes in the back. You know. He's like, what are these? You know, and I was like, they're cassette tapes. If you want to take them, put them in and, and listen to them. You know, I was trying to be nice and tell him, you know, about Islam a little bit, but he wasn't having it. And, you know, he let us get up. So all of that was going on. We felt a lot of pressure. But I was like you, you know, I was one of those that were like, uh, you know, just I didn't care. You know, like, what are you going to yeah. do? To, you yeah, know? what are you going to do? Because yeah, yeah, we. Like, we're not raised in a, when, we, yeah. when you're raised in America. You raised with a certain type of spirit of fearlessness. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, don't, you know you don't have um, you don't have this. Uh, you know we weren't raised unto, uh, under a an oppressive regime that you know that might pull you out of your house in the middle of the night and and, right. and, right. and put you in the gulag. You know yeah, we weren't raised like we don't hear. Yeah, alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah for uh, for that. But we, you know, we don't, so we don't have those types of um, fears. And not to say 
that these fears are irrational on the part of people who have these fears because some people actually experience these types of things and and, and their fears are are, are are rational, you know? I mean, we see what our brothers and sisters in Philistine are going through now. I mean, you can't imagine the generational trauma that they're gonna pass on and live live through, you know, uh, because of what they're going through now and what they've been going through. You know, may Allah, may Allah aid them and assist them. And, I mean, Ya Rab, I mean, I mean, Ya Allah, I mean, yeah. So that, so, so during those times, you you handled it well, and uh, yeah, 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 it was I'm doing that. Can you, because there might be some people watching, maybe they're new to Islam or they're thinking about how am I going to pray? What's that all about? What from your journey, the salah, did it take time? Or was it something you started doing right away? Um, pretty much right away. I started. I started praying uh, almost right away. I mean, I didn't. Um, I would say after uh, after about two weeks of being a Muslim, I never missed a prayer after that. Um, um, you know, or never intentionally missed a prayer after that. You know. Uh, yeah. Um, but you know. Um, I know. Uh, I. Uh, <clears throat> You know, but the first two weeks was a little rocky because I only prayed when I was around Muslims or, you know, at the masjid. But, I, you know, that first two weeks I was trying to be around the masjid as much as possible. But, like, I didn't really know how to pray that well. So, you know, when I was by myself and the time for prayer comes and especially you don't really know when the times, you know, you still you still figuring everything out. But after two weeks, Alhamdulillah, I had it figured out. And so the prayer Actually, you know, I'll tell you one thing about the prayer. Uh, I remember one time I was I was working. I was at a mall and I was doing a job and the time for prayer came. And, um, I, you know, and it was also prayer. And like the, the sun started getting low and I'm looking for a place to pray. I'm looking for somewhere that I can find that it's, you know, private where I don't I'm not in the walkway or I'm not in any anybody's way. And so finally, I, I found a place to pray and then I prayed. But I was getting really anxious you know you know that that anxiety you feel when the prayer is getting too late and yeah. you're afraid that you might miss it or, or yeah. you know, that anxiety and then boom as soon as you pray that anxiety lifts off of you yeah. and so i came to a realization that subhanallah as long as i have this prayer there's nothing that they can really take away from me like like as long as i hold on to this prayer what else could they do to me Mm. Right. And it felt it was such an empowering thing to feel that way, you know, mm. you know, and, and and to feel that like, you know, like the prayer is everything and everything else is secondary money and cars and, you know, uh, properties and, and, and everything. You know, I, I just felt like, wow, there's nothing more important in, in this dunya except for this prayer, you know, this connection with my Lord. And, and you know, I remember feeling that way. And it was, um, <clears throat> you know, um, of course, you know. As time goes on, you know, this is this is a very high point in Iman, you know, and as time goes on, you know, the, the nature of Iman is it goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down and it goes right. up based on your good deeds and it goes down based on your bad deeds. So sometimes you have high Iman and sometimes you have low Iman, but there's always these moments that um, that help you and get bring you back to high Iman because you can remember, man, when I used to have high Iman. You know, I I used to I used to think like this, and so that you can repent, and and you can sort of get back to those actions that you used to do if you, you know, if you stray away or if you, um, you know, if you, uh, or if you're not as active in good deeds as you used to be. You know what I mean? You get busy with dunya. I think this happens to all of us. You know. Mm -hmm. So isn't it a beautiful thing how salah really keeps you in check? The salah yeah. keeps, yeah. Allah, keep... Subhanallah. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallam, where he mentioned that uh, that the prayers, salawatul khams, and then he said, wal jumu'atu ila al jumu'ati, and then he mm. said, wa Ramadan ila Ramadan, they are mukafirat. Mukafirat means that uh, an expiation of what is in between them, as long right. as you stay away from the major sins. Right. And yeah, you know, um, pondering upon that, man, the five daily prayers, no doubt, is that, you know, because without it, man, we would be lost, man, subhanAllah. 
Yeah. Love. You know, imagine because naturally, you know, like you said, your iman goes up and then it goes down, right? It goes up and goes down. But then when the iman goes down, you know, if without those five daily prayers, we veer off so far away from Allah. So just, yeah, who knows how far you can think name. without those prayers. And without Ramadan as well, because Ramadan is the big, you know, the the big heart um, uh, 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 correction, you know, like Ramadan comes to correct yeah. the hearts. And so, you know, you know, your heart, your heart your, or your iman could be going up and down and up and down but it's not always just staying up and down up and down on one straight line maybe it's going down slowly right but then ramadan comes and boosts you so you don't you know or maybe your iman is going up and ramadan comes and boosts you further right yeah. this ramadan is is uh you know subhanallah and it feels like ramadan comes at the perfect time every year every i mean year, man. every year it's like i needed this ramadan you know and you <laughs> You know, and then after Ramadan, of course, you know, you you have all types of, you know, you feel fatigued, but you also feel like, you know, your iman is higher because you've been engaged in good deeds all all month. And, and um, you know, you're, you're you're happy to go back to uh, your, your regular routine, but you're sad to see Ramadan go. It's like, you know, you have all these ranges, ranges of emotions. But at the end of the day, this is the dunya, man, and, and everything is a blessing. Yeah. Subhanallah. Akhi, uh, if you can, uh, you know, give some advice if there's a non-Muslim watching, you know, why should they look into Islam? Why should they accept Islam? I know it's a tough question, but just some basic, yeah. advice, you know. The best I could say is that, you know, on the day of judgment, because mm. We're all be, we're all going to stand in front of Allah on the day of judgment, and um, that's something that there's no doubt about. We're all going to stand in front of Allah on the day of judgment, and we're going to meet our Lord. And when we meet our Lord, we're not going to meet Allah and 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 be admitted into paradise and saved from the hellfire based on our good deeds. You know, our good deeds are are not going to um, be enough to get us there. What's going to be what 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 Allah is going to admit us into paradise for is going to be His mercy. And um, and uh, and if we don't if we don't uh, take steps to to move close to Allah, then um, Allah will not move close to us. You know, so if you remain distant from from Allah, Allah will remain distant from you. We know the Hadith, of the Prophet Sallallahu He says that when um, you know, when when the when the human being comes to me uh, walking, I come to him running. Yeah. Right? And uh, this is the Hadith Qudsi, actually. Yes. The Hadith Qudsi, where where if you know, if Allah, if if you walk come to Allah walking, Allah comes to you running. Right. And so, um, you know, and I'm paraphrasing. I think there's right. more. Yeah, to, uh, on a uh, handspan. If you come to Allah with a handspan, He will come to you dira, like an 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 arm's length. And then, if you come to Allah as a gel walking, He will come to you, you know, running and so on and so forth. Now, right, right. And this is a this is a um, and this is a, a, a hadith Qudsi is actually a narration directly from our Lord. You know, who tells us that we. That, that so it's a it's upon us to make effort to move closer to Allah and to move closer to our Lord, and um, and if we don't do that, if we don't make that effort, you know, it's like uh, if you don't apply for the job, you're never going to get the position. Yeah, subhanAllah. You know, you have to make effort. Very well, very well put. And I know the scholars you mentioned that is by the mercy of Allah Azawajal. I remember reading about this that how to earn the mercy of Allah Azawajal. Is by trying through your deeds. Yeah, that's how he created this this world. Is that we have to put some kind of effort, you know. Yeah. So I, I hope if there's any you know non-Muslims watching, you know, uh, ask ask your Lord, ask the Lord, the Creator of everything that exists, for guidance. Yeah, ask for guidance. That's yeah. it. It's it's impossible 
for him not to guide you if you really deep down in your heart want that guidance and you ask him for it so it's impossible allah so, will not turn away anyone who wants guidance that's Never. True. That's yeah true. sometimes it's our own arrogance to make us think that we don't need guidance we are we have it all figured out right you right. know we have it all figured yeah. out already you know I, I i got this you know and that's actually one of the pitfalls of this dunya is is, is this this society or you know this culture uh uh in general is that people want to want to feel as if they they have it all figured out yeah. you know but um at the end of the day when we when we lay in bed and you know think about our day by ourselves we if we're honest with ourselves we know we don't have it figured out but we want the world to think we have it figured out right all right, right? So, yeah we want the world to think we have it figured out and that we you know and we want everyone to think think we're smart and wealthy and and um you know uh all put together right that's that's the image we want the world to believe about us but when we lay in bed we we know uh we know all our faults better than anyone knows our faults because we're the ones who who did them and so you know that's the time when it's really important when 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 it's quiet to actually have that conversation with Allah and ask for guidance at that time because you know that's that's when um that's when Allah actually you know we know that Allah comes down yeah in the last third of the night last third of the night and will answer the the the, the du'as of the sincere you yeah. know so it's important yeah it's important to have that connection Alhamdulillah. if I didn't have that connection I'd be I'd be shot out yeah for sure so <laughs> all of us if I, if, I, if I didn't charge my my phone the battery would be dead Right. And it would be worthless. <laughs> you got to plug in, yeah. No doubt Islam is a perfect system de designed by the creator of all that exists to where we recharge our batteries every day, five times a day. So That's right. Yeah, it keeps us going, man. Alhamdulillah yeah, yeah. for that. Yeah. Akhi, uh, Dawood, man, it has been a pleasure, brother. I love you. Thank you for doing this. The pleasure is mine. Uh, you know, it, it raised my iman. When you told the story of when you made your shahada, that was a beautiful thing, subhanAllah. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. May, Allah, may Allah accept it. May Allah accept it from, from me and may Allah accept it from you. I mean, I mean, I mean. Inshallah, maybe on the next one, whoever we, you know, share their story, uh, you join the panel, uh, you know, like a co host, inshallah. Yeah. yeah. Personality, mashallah. You know? Yeah, Marakallah. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, I'm serious, inshallah. And uh, you know, so we can share these stories to the people, man. There's so they can hear the how Allah guided us. And uh, you know, the sahaba they used to sit around and, and talk like this as well. You find Are you it, going to do this more frequently? Yeah, I'm gonna try to do it more frequently, inshallah. I did it a few years ago and then there was a long break, and then now with you, you know, um it rekindled the desire to do it some more. I really enjoy it, alhamdulillah, and hearing yeah, people's yeah. stories of how Allah guided them. That's always an iman raiser, and that's what we're after, you know, is so that somebody can be interested in Islam by watching this, and also the people who Allah already has guided that it can serve as an iman boost, and they can think of the times when Allah guided yeah. them as well. So yeah, we'll, we'll uh, I'll keep you updated. We'll uh, you know interview somebody soon. If you got some people in mind, uh, let me know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to be a help any in any way I can be a help. Yeah, sure. Allah well, bless you for that. You know, yeah, we can collaborate inshallah. Yeah, and by the way, the the check out his artwork. You know, I know a lot of people watching that they, they see it, but mashallah, you got you got your hands in a lot of things, right? You did you did cars, right? Yeah, I do. Um, some famous ones too. That spot in Riyadh, the barbecue. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. I did the so yeah, many, did the you know, uh, famous yeah. people are going in there, and that's your logo on there. Mashallah, Allahumma barik. Yeah, I saw. I that's saw the picture bro. of uh, who was it? Kanye West and uh, Kanye West. Yeah, our brother, our brother uh, Muta. Muta, yeah, and then so many. Uh, he was there, and and so many boxes. Like every time they have, it's become the spot to go. When they have these boxing events, you know, they all right. go in there. And and uh, recently, right. they, they we all get Texas Brooks barbecue in, in Riyadh. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah, that's a classic. I remember when you made that that logo. Yes, yeah, Smoky Beards. When you when you made that logo, it was 
it was beautiful. I remember the brother Arthan, uh, he showed it to me and my brother, and we was like, man, that's that's on point. And also, you know, I actually I made that logo in the um, I made that logo in the DC airport. No, yeah, subhanallah, in the airport. Life. In the airport because I was I was flying, yeah I was flying and I and I and and my 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 flight got um, delayed. I got I got delayed and I was sitting in the DC airport like well, and and yeah and it was right while I was uh, communicating uh, with you about the logo. Yeah, right? that was with you, that was with you. Uh, I can't remember. It was we all had like. There were, I was communicating with a few different uh, people. You were, you, were you were communicating with my brother, Luan. With your brother, Luan. Yeah, yeah he was communicating with you. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, okay. made it over, you gave it to him, and, and you know, uh, and I remember seeing it, and I, I love the look. It was like, it's like the, the color, and I, I think the, the beard shape, the, the guy, it's like in a Q shape, I think, also. Right, right. It had right. This, like retro feel to it. It's just, it just looks like a smoky barbecue place. It's nice. Yeah, you no, know, that's that's my gift. You know, Allah Ta'ala gave me that. So I already, alhamdulillah, that's one of the things that Allah, Allah will say, you know, that's one of the things that I always say is that, you know, um, I, I always know somebody will talk and they say, and they'll just say a few words about how they want their logo to look. And I'll, and I'll say, oh, okay, stop. I got it. I got it. And, and, then, and then I'll do it and they'll go, how did you know? And I'll say, well, you you told me, and they say, no, I didn't tell you. But it's like they, I read between the lines, and that's something that AI can't really do. AI can't really read between the lines that way and, and catch the nuances of things, you know? Right, right. Because um, you know, no, there's nothing like the human touch to it, man. Uh, you nothing know, like the human touch. AI art, you know, maybe it might work for some if you need something quick, but. Nothing like the human touch, man. Mashallah. That's, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know as much as the AI, AI though. Hey, by the way, there's a brother Bilal. He wrote on there, brother Dawood and Luan look similar. Mashallah. You know. Yeah, you I've, know, I've, I've heard that before. That, that that's a handsome brother right there. The brother uh, Elir is a very handsome brother. Mashallah. He's talking about my brother. My brother. You and my brother look yeah. alike. You know. Yeah. Mashallah. But he's a handsome brother too. So yeah. that's <laughs> <laughs> so uh you know it's been a pleasure man inshallah we'll keep in touch yeah yeah and uh so we'll uh we'll end it here i know we left us i know so many stories man you know we're just cracking the ice you know but I mean, maybe we could do a part two where like yeah, we'll do a part two and fill it in do a part two like we got the baseline and we'll do a part two inshallah if anybody's yeah. interested then we uh yeah, we continue inshallah. It was a pleasure, man. Allah bless you and Allah bless your family. I mean, I mean, I mean. So we'll end it with Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Zakum al khair. Salam alaykum. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.